kids who are going to be dead tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Since the heyday of the big four slashers, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, and Chucky, slasher movie fans have continually searched for the next great villain. That's not to say there haven't been any good ones at all, though it's doubtful that there are any as enduring as those originals. As horror fans, we're always looking for a piece of the glory days, when slashers were a new phenomenon and there was something collectively thrilling about them we all loved. Even when it was a supernatural style slasher, the modern settings were fresh, as opposed to the old gothic haunted houses, castles, and other locations of previous generations. The slasher's rise in popularity did coincide with a spike in real-life serial murder. After Peeping Tom, Psycho, Black Christmas, and a few other choice movies shaped the modern slasher, once the 1960s ended and the 1970s were well underway, media coverage of serial killers dominated cultural interest in the West. People like Ted Bundy, Albert Salvo, Edmund Kemper, Richard Trenton Chase, among others, were a regular part of the news cycle. By the time the 1980s rolled around, more murderers were turned into household names worldwide. And horror lovers were busy drinking from a seemingly endless cup of slasher movies. It's not that murder is any less popular today. I mean, true crime has become a huge interest from documentary shows on TV and Netflix to podcasts and talk radio. It's more a case that even those who love horror are burned out by the slasher, and it takes a special villain, or film in general, to pique interest in the subgenre again. That's why, when Mick Taylor showed up in Greg McLean's 2005 horror film Wolf Creek, he was a nasty breath of fresh air for slasher films. More than that, McLean was inspired by one of the worst killers from his own country, Australia. A man called Ivan Milat. Knife. That's a knife. Between 1989 and 1993, Milat terrorized New South Wales, Australia. At that time, he wasn't known as the one who was killing young people throughout the area, many hitchhikers. He was a member of a well known family whose traditions seemed to be criminal behavior of all varieties. In those five years, seven partially buried corpses were found in the Belanglo State Forest, five of whom were foreigners backpacking in Australia. These brutal crimes became known across Australian media as the Backpacker Murders. In Wolf Creek, McLean plays the plot out like any other slasher horror film in that the killer's not the main character like he might be if it were a serial killer biopic. The film starts out with 30 minutes or more focused on the perspective of three people who will eventually become the victims of Milat. Only here, his name is Mick Taylor, and he's played with menacing delight by John Jarrett. Wolf Creek, as well as 2013's Wolf Creek 2, utilizes many of the familiar tropes of not just the slasher subgenre, but also of backwoods horror to tell the serial killer's story. McLean sets everything in the deep outback, where people, let alone police, are scarce, and wilderness stretches into an endless horizon. There's a sense of spatial isolation, and social isolation too. In the first movie, Telltale signs are there as the soon-to-be victims, three travelers named Ben, Liz, and Christy enter the rural spaces of Australia. Initially, they're harassed by a bunch of local hillbilly stereotypes, and because we don't yet know the villain, these men could easily be the slashers to eventually hunt our victims down. Later, their car inexplicably breaks down in an inconveniently remote location. Finally, it's the appearance of Mick himself, posing as a friendly local, the same shtick Milat would use on backpackers to lure them into complacency, that heralds the beginning of all the terror, and checks off all the trope boxes. 
McLean's familiarity with the slasher movie works as a seamless adaptation from real life to fiction. If you didn't know beforehand about the based on a true story aspect of Wolf Creek, you might not realize this isn't just another fictional horror scenario. When you do know the real story on which McLean's screenplay is based, the similarities between Mick and his real-life counterpart Ivan are very evident, physical and otherwise. They're both well-built, rough-looking men. Their facial hair is similar. Ivan wore a handlebar mustache, whereas Mick sports mustache stubble and a thick pair of mutton chops. Both the fictional version and the real Malat lived in a remote area of the outback, providing them plenty of space to commit torture and gruesome murders relatively unbothered. In a scene where one of Mick's victims is trying to escape, she finds a room full of serial killer souvenirs. Tons and tons of backpacks, suitcases, cameras, cell phones, and other tourist-related items, like some of what was found on the Malat family property after Ivan's eventual arrest. In Wolf Creek 2, Mick comes upon two German backpackers who are based on two of Malat's actual victims, Gabor Neugbauer and Anja Habschied. Apologies for butchering their names and one of them is viciously decapitated just like one of the actual victims. Yet where Ivan and Mick are most alike lies in their psychopathy. After Mick has captured his victims, he exhibits behavior torn straight from the actual story of Ivan Milat. Milat showed signs of peakerism. He derived a sexual thrill from cutting and torturing his victims with a knife. He particularly enjoyed the penetrative act of stabbing a knife into someone's flesh. And this isn't hard to see in the fictional Mick, who carries a massive hunting knife to use on his prey. McLean's screenplay plays on the real Malat's peakerism while also delivering dark comedy aimed at the pop culture portrayal of Australian identity, further acting as subtle foreshadowing. In an early scene of the original Wolf Creek, Ben riffs on the famous Crocodile Dundee and the tired, That's not a knife, this is a knife, as he and his travel companions sit around the fire back at Mick's place. The joke doesn't really sit well with Mick, but it's later the joke comes to have even more grim significance after Mick's revealed his sinister intent for playing Good Samaritan to the travelers and their broken down vehicle. He utters the line from Crocodile Dundee again, while using the knife to stab one of the women. A smart, albeit very cruel, moment of expert writing on McLean's part. That's not a knife. <laughs> this is a knife. Another terrifying link between Malat and Mick's peakerist behavior is what the latter so eloquently refers to as making a head on a stick. Lots of slashers have stabbed people in the spine. No big deal, right? Well, Malat was twisted and part of his psychopathy was a need to torture, to inflict the maximum amount of pain possible on a still-living victim. One method he used was stabbing a victim in the spine and twisting his knife around to sever all the necessary parts of the spine while making sure the victim wouldn't die. This allowed him time to torture his victims as he pleased. During several scenes featuring Mick's Outback House of Horrors, corpses are visible in the background. There's one specific ravaged corpse tied up, and she no longer has a head. This seems to be what happens when Mick is finished, after his victims are finally dead, because his thrill comes from them undergoing the torture and reacting to it. Referring to this paralyzed head on a stick, Mick tells the victim he's currently torturing. Well, it lasted a good few months. We were great together, you know? Until she lost her head. All together now! Time to kangaroo down, sport. Time to kangaroo down. We can't neglect McLean's sequel, Wolf Creek 2, as an important part of the genetic slasher makeup in Mick's DNA, and this is for a couple reasons. First, the character Paul Hammersmith is loosely based on the one person to successfully escape Malat's clutches, 
a British man called Paul Onions. The real Paul wasn't tortured like the fictional one. He managed to flee Malat's truck when the killer, who introduced himself not as Ivan but Bill, took out ropes and tried tying him up. The police took a statement from Onions but nothing was done and it wasn't until clearer evidence was uncovered several years later that his statement became relevant. The impromptu Australian trivia game Mick forces Paul to play in the film is well-adapted writing by McLean as a way to illustrate the sick way in which the real Malat toyed with his victims before dispatching them. Coupled with the ending, when Mick willingly lets Paul go, not without being badly wounded and stripped nearly naked, McLean tells the story of Wolf Creek 2 in a way that, even more than the first film, evokes Malat's crimes. Perhaps the most perfect part of McLean's writing is how, at the end of both Wolf Creek and Wolf Creek 2, the incompetence of police work done in the real case of Malat is exemplified by how Ben and Paul, the surviving victims of each respective film, are treated as suspects in the disappearance and murder of backpackers in the area. All the while the real killer walks off into the sunset of the outback, free to kill again. McLean effectively uses Mick and Wolf Creek like any other slasher villain, though knowing the real story of Milat elevates the horror to a scarier, even more visceral level. This killer is not just different from supernatural slashers, or slashers who remain hidden behind a mask. He's based on a true human monster. Serial killers terrify us so much because they are, more often than not, totally regular people to the outward world. Malat wrought so much terror because, like Mick, he played the good guy role for the people upon whom he preyed, and once his victims figured out his true nature and intentions, it was always too late. Wolf Creek and Wolf Creek 2 work as well as they do because they're not treated as the serial killer biopic that we might get if McLean decided to portray Malat as himself, rather than the fictional Mick Taylor. The story becomes a double-edged sword, in the way that it can be viewed as just another slasher, effective or not, and the way that simultaneously, the real life of Malat always lurks on the periphery of nearly every single scene. No matter if horror is totally fictional or ripped from the pages of life, it can scare the hell out of us. There's no denying horror based in reality can sometimes make our skin crawl to a greater extent, if only for the fact these kinds of killers could be any regular person. And the parallels McLean draws between Mick and Milat are designed to frighten us to the bone. You bombing child! I like scary movies. Uh huh. The suitable for viewing in the home comes from the video recordings bill, often called the Video Nasties Bill, which is soon expected to pass into law. What's your favorite scary 